and okay, we're started. So um, it's my pleasure to welcome everybody to the April 2021 Sunday Seminar. We are very, very happy to have with us uh, the beneficiary of our Advent um, offering, and that is the Barefoot Republic Camp. Uh, sure. Barefoot Republic is a camp based in um, Nashville, Tennessee, and their mission is celebrating diversity and building unity among people of all racial, cultural, and socioeconomic backgrounds. So um, without further ado, um, I would love to introduce to our speaker, the Executive Director of Barefoot Republic, Tommy Rhodes. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you guys uh, for having me. Uh, it was such a such a blessing to receive you all's gift. Uh, I told Michelle we had no idea, you know, how the Lord was going to use uh, the Nightline uh, feature that was done on our ministry this past summer, and it was just so wonderful, you know, to see how God just continues to raise people up and connect dots uh, as only He can. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys are wondering, you know, maybe what what is Barefoot Republic and, and where did the name come from? Uh, I often forget to share, you know, that important piece of the story, uh, but it's, it's raised a lot of eyebrows through the years and really just confused some people, and including uh, a lot of our marketing and communications folks. Uh, so before I jump in uh, to a little bit of my testimony and story, I'll tell you the story about how we came up with the name Barefoot Republic. Uh, we had spent a couple of years trying to come under the umbrella of an existing camp. Um, and one little spin or twist we wanted to put on traditional Christ-centered camping was to be intentionally diverse and recruit kids from different economic backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds. And we really felt like that'd be a beautiful picture of heaven uh, and just a, a, an active response uh, to what Jesus prayed for, John 17. Uh, when he prayed for believers to be brought to complete unity. Uh, the, the sad part was we couldn't find a partner. Uh, we couldn't find anybody that wanted to take us on. And so we finally kind of pushed out on our own and we were praying about what our small groups of campers would be called. And we love the idea of republics because most of the summer camps that we were aware of had campers divided up into Indian tribes. And uh, we actually had some Native American friends that wanted to participate in the camp. And we realized that, wow, that's not gonna be real culturally sensitive. You know, if we ask our friends uh, from a, a Cherokee background to be in the Choctaw tribe. And so we, we finally landed on this idea of republics and kids coming in and kind of forming their own identity together uh, as they have these unique shared experiences together. Oftentimes, you know, for the first time uh, for rich and poor or black, white, Hispanic and refugee or even artist and athlete. And so we love publics, you know, being kind of their shared identity. We didn't know what to put with it. And I had a friend that was reading a book by Henry Nowen called The Prodigal Son, which some of you guys may have read before. And uh, we were driving back from the, the last camp that had said no to partnering with us. It's about 2.30 in the morning. And my friend in the back seat blurts out, Barefoot Republic to my wife and I, and we kind of look in the back seat. And we're just like, Mary, are you are you awake back there? You know, what are you talking about, Barefoot Republic? And she read this beautiful page uh, that Henry Nowen had written about these orphan children who were walking around in the street barefoot. And as we started thinking about just the, the imagery, um, the the idea, even the spiritual posture of of coming into an experience barefoot we loved it because we're like wow you know if all you can see is somebody's feet you know you don't know if they're a prince or a pauper you know being barefoot and into an experience barefoot i mean it's, it's a beautiful representation of vulnerability our humanity our, our brokenness and um, we just felt like god could do so much uh, if we could invite kids into a shared experience barefoot uh, so that's kind of where the name originated from, and that was back in 2000, 2001. Uh, but to back up a little bit, uh, God really kind of stirred up this vision for Barefoot Republic uh, in and through me, uh, just via my testimony. And so I, I think there's three really amazing things that God does in all of our lives, and that is he finds people, he frees people, and he focuses people. And as I look back on my life, kind of those three kind of pivotal moments uh, for me spiritually 
they all revolved around summer camp, you know, surprise, surprise. Uh, but I did fight God for many, many years. Uh, but briefly, you know, as I grew up, uh, I grew up in a Japanese American family. And I don't know if you can see that in my eyes or not. Um, but I grew up in a very small town in Alabama that was all black and all white. And we were kind of the one Asian American family uh, that I knew about. And so there was just a lot of jokes, a, a lot of prejudice, a lot of racism um, in, in that small town in general, but particularly for my family. And it wasn't a spiritual family. Uh, my mom was 17 when she got pregnant. Um, she ended up kidnapping me from my father's side of the family. I was born in Mineola, New York, uh, up in uh, your neck of the woods. Uh, and my mom and her parents had kidnapped me from my father's side and started over in this small town in Alabama. Uh, to fast forward a little bit, mom went through a couple of other marriages, uh, she got an you know, somehow with her hip as a single mom and uh, loved me the best way that she knew how. But it, it truly was not a, a spiritual family. My mom was kind of your stereotypical uh, flower child, you know, from the, the 70s. And we moved to Nashville to start over. That was a, a real popular uh, phrase or expression in our family. And so we were starting over again. Uh, towards the end of my ninth grade year of high school. And so that's a tough time to move, as you guys can imagine. And uh, I really thought Nashville was a step down, you know, from the big city of Decatur, Alabama. Uh, but lo and behold, I met a friend uh, that invited me to church for the first time on the tennis team. And uh, he was he was a real evangelist. I mean, my buddy John kept talking to me, you know, about fellowship. You need to come out for fellowship. And I had no idea what fellowship was, you know, the, the word actually sounded a little bit creepy you know, to me, 15 year old asked him, you know, what do you, what do you mean by fellowship? What, what, what is that? And he's like, well, you know, I know you love basketball and we have a good basketball team and we have a great youth group and there's a lot of cute girls in the youth group. And I think that's what fellowship is. And obviously he didn't really know what fellowship was either, uh, but he was trying to get me out there and he knew I loved girls and basketball. And so I started going to this church and I remember my mom saying, Tommy, you know, I've, I've been around Christians before. And, and just so you know, you know, all, you know, just self-righteous hypocrites. But, you know, you're 15, you know, if you want to go, knock yourself out. I mean, that was kind of her attitude. And so I kind of went into the whole experience, you know, a, a little cynical about it. Um, but man, I just felt so loved and, and so accepted. Uh, by this youth group. And it was really invigorating for me uh, to just feel like people were kind of meeting me where I was, uh, began to feel a little bit more comfortable in my skin. Uh, my mom really struggled um, with alcoholism. She was a very functional alcoholic. And I'd started, you know, mimicking a lot of that behavior, you know, as early as 11, 12 years old, and just falling into some really bad patterns, uh, um, you know, early in adolescence. And so this was like a breath for me, and I didn't know much about church hierarchies or organizational charts, uh, but the, the guy that got up on Sunday and always spoke, and who was always out front shaking hands and, and kissing babies, uh, for some reason was pursuing me and, and wanting a relationship with me. And so for about a year and a half, I got to walk with this guy and be part of his family. Uh, his name was Matt Canna. And uh, Mac would invite me over to, to his home every Sunday for lunch after church. He had a couple of kids that were younger than me. And there was just something uniquely different about Mac. And I really didn't get the courage to ask him, you know, what that was until I got to go to a summer camp. And so our church signed up to be part of a conference, uh, really more of a conference than a, a traditional summer camp. But nonetheless, uh, the same principle, it got to the house. I didn't have to worry about, you know, where my meals were coming from, if my mom was coming home that night. I mean, just all, all of my core needs were taken care of. And it gave me the space to, to look at Mac and, and ask him that. And, and I remember it distinctly sitting outside of the dormitories at the college we were staying at. And I just said, Mac, you know, I, I continue to mess up, you know, make bad decisions. And you just keep reaching your arms out to me and, and just loving me. And I'm like, what, what is that? You know, it's like, I want to be able to love like that. Uh, I want to be able to forgive like that. And I remember Mac, you know, pointing back to the gospel and just saying, Tommy, I'm just trying to love you like Jesus loves you. And that was so compelling for me uh, after seeing him walk that out so consistently in my life, about a year and a half. 
And so I made a profession of faith um, sitting outside that dormitory as I prayed with him. And I was 16 years old, and that's when God found me. Uh, fast forward, um, I was 18 years old and, and struggling a little bit spiritually. Uh, I grew up in a very performance-oriented environment. I'm sure some of you guys can identify it. And, and so I, I always did well in school because, you know, that's what got some attention from my mom, you know, we didn't have a very affectionate relationship. We didn't say I love you or hug, uh, but if I made straight A's, I kind of got a pat on the back and, and $10. And um, at this point in life, you know, mom is in with her accounting degree from low income uh, to lower middle income. And so we were doing a little bit better financially, uh, but still just not a real deep connection with my mother. And I uh, just really struggled to understand some of the decisions that she was making and some of the things that she was struggling with. My grandfather had died during this time. And so our relationship had really hit rock bottom. Um, and since I had become a, a believer in Christ, you know, I was trying to witness to her, you know, trying to share, you know, about this transformation in my life. And it wasn't received very well at all. And it really kind of created even more distance, you know, in our relationship. And I remember on my 18th birthday on March 25th, of 1990, she walked into my bedroom and she gave me a piece of paper. And on this piece of paper, uh, I recognized a name of a man who had the last name of Rhodes, uh, just like myself. I didn't know anybody named Rhodes at this point in my life and had actually thought about changing my last name to honor uh, my maternal grandfather because he had passed away as I shared a couple of years prior. And she looked at me and she's like, you're a man now. And I'm like, I am, you know, I don't feel any different than I did yesterday. And uh, she's like, no, you're, you're an adult and you can make your own decisions. This is the last contact information I had for your father. You know, if you want to reach out to him, you know, that's your decision now. And of course, you know, I didn't feel like I'd really missed out on anything because I, I'd never known him. I was so young uh, when I was taken from him. But of course, Oprah Winfrey, you know, come along in the 80s and started doing all these reunion shows and long lost siblings and long lost parents. And, you know, I started asking questions as I got older and I was certainly curious as to, to what happened. And I finally got the courage, you know, to dial these numbers, which I assumed would be disconnected, you know, after 16 or 17 years. And lo and behold, a guy with a really thick uh, Long Island accent picks up the telephone and I just said, hey, I'm, I'm Tommy Rhodes. Um, looking at, I think I may be his son. And he just immediately said, I've been waiting for you to call, you know, for 17 years. That just, you know, shook me to my, as you can imagine, you know, just instantaneously in the snap of a finger, I'm speaking to my biological father, you know, for the first time. And it was so refreshing, you know, to be able to talk to this guy about sports and music and girls and just, you know, things I could never have a conversation with my mom about, but what was most refreshing was um, my, my dad was a drug addict and he was able to articulate some of his struggles, you know, with his addiction. And so he was a medic in Vietnam and, and marijuana was kind of the classic gateway drug for him. And uh, he had lost a second family. I've got three half brothers that I still don't know, but he had lost a, a second family uh, to his drug addiction and he kind of affirmed my mom for the decision you know that she had made to take me from him but the part that really stuck out to me was just being able to have an honest you know transparent conversation about addiction because you just couldn't go there you know in my family growing up and that was that was hard and uh, that was something that always confused me a lot uh, certainly the behavior that came out of that addiction as well and so dad and i got really close really quick and i ended up spending uh, the summer of my freshman year of college uh, in New York City, uh, where Michelle works, uh, delivering fish uh, to Fulton Street Fish Market uh, from 2.30 to 4.30, you know, in the morning, driving a truck, going to LaGuardia and JFK, you know, getting these deliveries in order. But uh, I got to spend some quality time with my dad. I had brought a good friend with me from college, uh, just because I was very insecure, you know, moving up to the big city, you know, for the summer. And uh, despite all the sweets my dad and I had, I ended up catching uh, him uh, using drugs uh, with my friend towards the end of the summer. And it just, it broke my heart. 
And uh, I really hit rock bottom spiritually at this point in time and, and didn't really know what to do because my mom wasn't really uh, in my life at this point. And, and now I felt like I had to sever this relationship uh, with my father because I just didn't know what to believe. You know, I thought we had this relationship built on truth. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's pulling my 19 year old friend into his addiction uh, when I thought he was sober. Uh, so that's really what led up to the Lord freeing me. Uh, so the summer of my sophomore year of college, I got a, a call from my buddy uh, who I knew in my old hometown of Decatur, Alabama, and he knew I was a tennis player in college. And he said, hey, you remember that camp I used to go to as a kid? Um, our guy, you know, most of our guys, you know, at the camp, you know, grew up as campers there, but we need somebody at the last minute because he has to go to summer school. So would you be interested in coming to work at this camp for the summer? And, you know, as you can imagine, you know, talk about insecure. I just, I could not even fathom the idea of being at a summer camp for an entire summer. And I really felt like, you know, a lot of these kids would have nothing in common with me because they came from more affluent backgrounds. And lo and behold, I took this leap of faith and I ended up going there in the 11th hour. And I, I get there and they're just like, hey, Tommy, actually, we're going to ask you to be in charge of a Catholic kids and teach basketball and weightlifting because we have somebody else that can fake tennis. And I'm like, oh my goodness, they're taking away like the one thing I'm comfortable doing. You know, did this camp do a background check? There's no reason why I should be responsible for, you know, young people's lives. You know, somebody's going to die. You know, it's just like, I couldn't imagine, you know, being in charge of these kids uh, for, you know, two weeks at a time, four weeks at a time. Uh, but God just really turned my life upside down that summer because lo and behold, Yes, these kids came from very affluent backgrounds, uh, which I could not identify with. I, I thought I knew rich people just from being in tennis circles, and I really didn't like what I had experienced, you know, of people that came from affluent backgrounds, because I felt like they had privileges and opportunities that I never had uh, as an up-and-coming tennis player. Uh, but these kids started sharing about not having healthy relationships with their parents, or their parents being alcoholics, or struggling with drug addiction, or divorce and, you know, kids eight, nine, 10 years old, just kind of pulled out to me. And for the first time I saw God using little pieces of my story, the things that had really hurt me and, and wounded me and even caused me to kind of question my faith. Uh, the Lord was using those wounds to help heal, you know, the wounds of this next generation, you know, of young boys. And it was so endearing. It was so redemptive. And that's truly when God freed me from just all the sin and the baggage, you know, that I've been carrying around for so long. And it was so sweet because these, these, these guys would go home and write letters, you know, back in 1992, we still wrote letters and they would send me letters in the mail, thanking me. And their moms would send letters to me in the mail, you know, thanking me. And I remember at the end of the summer, I was feeling pretty self-righteous and just kind of wondering, you know, why didn't I get this opportunity? You know, I can't imagine you know, if I could have went to a place like this and some college guy would have hung out with me when I was eight or 10 or 12 and how would that have just dramatically, you know, impacted some of the poor decisions, you know, that I was making at that age, you know, just to have somebody spend time with me on the basketball court or have a conversation with me and, and answer some hard questions that I was struck. And I remember my mom saying, Tommy, have you asked them how much it cost? And I just was so frustrated. I was like, so you're telling me this is all about money? I mean, that's why I couldn't go every summer when my friend went. And she said, have you asked them? You should go ask them how much that camp cost. And so I did. You know, I went to the director and I was shocked. I mean, even back in the early 90s, it was a couple thousand dollars to go to the summer camp. And then my anger, you know, and self-righteousness kind of shifted from my mom to God. And, you know, I was in such a sweet place spiritually that summer, but I just was on this run, you know, going out to jog, just to kind of I just felt like I was saying to God, this isn't fair. You know, every kid deserves this opportunity, you know, to be in a place where they can just be loved unconditionally, feel comfortable on the skin. And I felt like God was saying, you're right. You know, why, why don't you do something about that, Tommy? <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm running around this camp just seeing dollar signs, you know, running past the gym and the lake and the horses and I'm just thinking how is somebody who comes from nothing uh, who doesn't even have two pennies to rub together you know ever going to be able to start a place like this 
So that's when God freed me and, and to get to the last phase when God focused me. It was eight years later and I was three years into my PhD at Vanderbilt University in the genetic medicine department. And I'd really just for the past eight years since that camp experience had just kind of put in my mouth that, okay, Lord, I'm going to do this thing. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know when I'm going to do it, you know, but the only thing I'm really good at is science. So let me focus on science. And then maybe one day, you know, and I'm 40 or 50 or 60, I'll get back to you. And this vision you kind of planted in my heart on this jog, you know, when I was 20 years old. Uh, fortunately, God had a plan. And so the Lord just blessed me with a lot of worldly success at Vanderbilt. And I was able to publish some papers in some of the top journals in the world. And, you know, all my peers and some of my professors, you know, would say, man, you're on the fast track. You know, you're, you're going places. And, you know, if, if people would you know about Tommy, you know, at, at 27, you know, they'd have been like, man, he's really focused. I mean, that dude is like dialed in, you know, he's going places. Uh, but what they didn't know was I spent about half my time, you know, gazing out the sixth floor of Medical Research Building 3 at Vanderbilt University, just feeling so empty and just so lost and so unfulfilled. And don't get me wrong. I mean, the worldly success was, was wonderful and it, and it felt good. And it was kind of cool to see your name on in nature, you know, whatever the journal was. Uh, but it just wasn't fulfilling. And I really was wrestling in my prayer life. And I met some amazing believers at Vanderbilt that really challenged me and said, man, what are you doing? You know, what, what's this carrot that you're chasing? You know, if God asked you to build a summer camp, why don't you go build a summer camp? You know, what are you doing here in the lab, you know, 24 hours a day? And so I really had, um, you know, just felt like I was at this crossroads and I was a newlywed at the time, had been married less than a year my wife thought married this hotshot scientist, kind of had one vision for our life. And uh, she knew about the pipe dream. You know, she knew that science in my heart was a means to an end. But I don't think she was ready for me to say, hey, honey, let's have a garage sale. I think we're supposed to sell all of our possessions and get some seed money together to go buy a farm to start a summer camp, uh, which is what quickly followed. And so that is truly when the Lord focused me when I finally let go of my, my worldly ambitions, when I finally let go of trying to do this thing he asked me to do in my own strength and, and just trusted him with it, just was obedient truly for the first time. And, um, you know, all of our possessions were only worth about $2,000 after two garage sales. So that was demoralizing and not quite enough seed money to go put a deposit, you know, on a piece of land. Uh, but incredibly, I had this baseball card collection. I don't know if any of you guys ever collected sports cards, uh, but that was kind of my refuge uh, near the Lord. I mean, if my mom didn't come home, if there were guys in the house, you know, if people were partying, I would just go back in my bedroom and I would just like build sets and memorize statistics and I could just lose myself on my sports cards. And eBay came along back in the late 90s when God was stirring all this up in me. And so I started selling my, my good cards on eBay and we got about $18,000 for them. And uh, I'll never forget, my mom was like, are you kidding me? All those cards that were like strewn all over the house, you got $18,000 for those. And I was like, yeah, mom, it's amazing. And uh, ironically, that's how much money I needed for the down payment on the farm uh, that is now Barefoot Republic Camp. Uh, so that was 1999. And to kind of close the loop on the circle, I'll, I'll open it up for some questions if we have time. Um, you know, that's when we started trying to find partner camps that would really get excited about a camping ministry that focused on reconciliation. You know, a camping ministry that looked like Revelation 7, 9, where there'd be all nations, tribes, and tongues, you know, gathered together, you know, just kind of creating, you know, a platform where there can be a little bit more heaven on earth and people can talk about their differences. Uh, one of my biggest struggles uh, as a 16 year old believer, I, I didn't see anybody in our church that looked like my family. And I, I couldn't understand why when we went on a visitation on Tuesday, we didn't visit people you know, that were from other backgrounds and we would drive past you know, certain neighborhoods. And I, I really wrestled with that. And I even got the courage to ask my pastor uh, who had led me to Christ, you know, about that very thing. And, and he said, Tommy, you know, if an African-American couple were to walk in the front door of our church, 
we would love them just like we love you and love anybody else. And I didn't have the courage to say it was, I was an African-American couple walk into the front door of our church. Have you seen our staff directory? You know, have, have you seen our congregation? I mean, and, and that was really the, the heart and the posture that I went into Barefoot Republic with was, you know, if we're going to be serious about diversity, if we're going to be intentional about bringing kids together from radically different backgrounds, we have to reflect that diversity from the top down. And so that's, that's been challenging uh, without a doubt, but the Lord has continued to bless. And we are now, this is gonna be our 20th summer of programming. And we've been able to serve over 50,000 people, you know, through our ministry. And we've had camps, not only in Kentucky and Tennessee, but also in Southern California. Uh, we had a camp I was sharing with Michelle up at the Pinelands in New Jersey uh, a few years ago. And it's just been incredible to see how the Lord has continued to connect us uh, people like you all that, that share our heart. And so it's such an exercise in faith and obedience and, and patience. I mean, so many of the fruits of this, you know, just, just to wait on the Lord and trust his timing, uh, trust his provision. Uh, even through COVID, we've never had a bill that has not been paid. And it's just been just so, you know, just the body of Christ kind of rally around us and just the fruit. Uh, now that we're into the second generation of campers, which is impossible to even believe, you know, that some of our former campers are now sending their kids and just seeing the, the ripple effect and the seeds that have been sown and how they've taken their shared experiences at summer camp, you know, back home to their communities and to their churches and to their schools and, and now even into their faith and, and what they're desiring and seeking uh, in the churches that they attend uh, and the ministries they participate with. Uh, just how God can just totally, you know, transform your life and your biblical worldview, you know, in five days at a summer camp. And so I think that's the, the, the power of the platform, you know, of summer camp is it really does allow you to have all your primary needs met. Um, we were over half our space for low income kids like myself, and we've been blessed to award over three million dollars in scholarships and uh, have always been able to say yes uh, to fans only through people like you all uh, that continue to come alongside us and, and help seed that scholarship fund uh, to where we don't have to worry about that. You know, we're, we're not about the bottom line. We're a nonprofit ministry and uh, just really looking to create more and more opportunities. And as the, the mission has has grown and evolved, you know, we're not bringing summer camp now for K through 12, uh, but we're also doing parent-child weekends. Uh, this whole season of COVID, uh, we really we had to shut down all of our traditional camps. But we were able to launch our family camps. And so we were only able to serve, you know, maybe one family, you know, maybe five families at a time uh, on a facility that's on 150 acres. But no less, our, our staff still showed up and just brought the same energy and enthusiasm and passion for the gospel uh, for one to five families that they bring for hundreds of kids at a time. And so that was so sweet for us, uh, looking back on this season of COVID. And, and one of the silver linings is just the importance for family camp, uh, especially family camp when you're bringing in families from, from different backgrounds. So I'll, I'll stop now. Um, and Michelle, you know, if there's time for questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you may all have about our ministry. Yeah, I'm happy to open the floor to anybody who has questions for Tommy. I, um, I, I have a question. Where do your children come from? Are they mostly from the city that your camp is in or do they come from all over? That is a, a wonderful uh, campers from, I think we're up to 78 different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, and we've had, you know, kids that are refugees in less than six months. And we've had, you know, kids from some of the biggest celebrities that you can possibly imagine. And it, it's only through partnerships. And from the very beginning, you know, what we heard about nonprofits was, oh, man, you guys are in Nashville. You know, you're so lucky. There's so much money in and affluence and it should be so easy to raise money. Um, and, and some of those things are true, but there's also maybe more nonprofits per capita in Nashville than anywhere else, you know, in the country. 
And so people were like, oh man, it's really competitive. I mean, do we really need one more nonprofit, Tommy? And it just felt like, you know, nonprofits were kind of doing this. And I'm like, even Christ-centered nonprofits. And I'm like, guys, I mean, this is not the body. You know, we have got to link arms. You know, we are certainly stronger together. And I realize it's, it's easier for me to say that, you know, because a partnership with Barefoot is, hey, we want to raise scholarship money to give to your organization if you guys can do the hard work, which is building the relationships and the trust with refugee communities, you know, with the inner city community, with the affluent communities. I mean, so much education, as you guys can imagine, you know, goes into building trust. Because just truly, you know, the, the camping culture and environment, you know, historically is more of a middle, upper income, white, you know, type of culture. And so, like, the, the his culture for example, man, the idea of them sending their baby, you know, off to some other place in the middle of Southern Kentucky for a week, nah, not happening, you know, not happening unless there's a partner that's going to stand in the gap that has a personal relationship with those parents. It's like, hey guys, I know Tommy, I I know Barefoot, it's going to be okay. And in fact, I'm going to go too, I'm going to be there as a volunteer that week. And so I'm going to load our van and I'll take our kids there. If we don't like it, we'll come back on Tuesday, you know? (laughs) And so that's really how it started. You know, we now have over a hundred partners, not just in middle Tennessee, but we have partners in New Jersey, you know, that load a van up and and drive kids down to Southern Kentucky. And we have kids from Compton, California, you know, where we did a day camp a few years ago that we raised not only their camp tuition, but their plane tickets and most of those kids are getting on an airplane for the first time in their lives and flying to Nashville to get in a van and drive to Kentucky. I mean, what an adventure, you know? It's like so many kids like myself that grew up low income, we don't realize the world is any bigger, you know, than our lower corners, you know, that we live in. And so that was part of our struggle as we started doing these satellite camps. You know, we were like, are we supposed to just duplicate ourselves like all over the country like the YMCA or Young Life is that is that what you're asking us to do Um, and and we're still wrestling with that just to be honest you know as a ministry and we've done vision casting trips uh, to Kenya to Israel and Jerusalem I mean it's just like God just keeps raising up partners you know that want a reconciliation ministry in their backyard and they want to know how to do it and we're just like are, are we supposed to go do it you know, we're supposed to go out there for a season and then, and then maybe they'll come to us. Uh, but as you guys can imagine, a lot of our low income partners, you know, it, it's hard, you know, to be able to just figure it out logistically and even overcome the fear of that first plane ride. You know, whereas affluent families, you know, it's like, oh, you know, we're, we're used to traveling, you know, that's no problem, you know, for us to, to get a plane ticket you know, and fly out to California to go to summer camp. And so as a ministry, that's, one of the things we're still walking through is like, do we just build the best king we can possibly build in Southern Kentucky and just trust that the Lord will make a way for people to come to us, you know, or are we supposed to eventually duplicate our ministry in other parts of the country so there's easier access? But to answer your question, it, it, it is all about partnerships. About 20% of our kids, you know, come through individual families that just kind of hear about us but about 80% of the kids are coming through partner organizations uh, that we've cultivated relationships with over the past 20 years. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Other questions? Well, I, um, I appreciate your journey. I mean, I just found it fascinating as you talked about all the things that you went through to bring you to where you are now. And so now that you're, um, you're running this camp now almost 20 years, how do you maintain the, the level of diversity between the, um, the racial mixes and the financial mixes so that everybody gets an opportunity to experience each other's life walk and then Christ in the midst of it all? Yeah. I mean, the the key word is intentionality. You know, that has been the key word, you know, since 1999. I had an African-American pastor that loved me so well 
uh, for about 10 years, first 10 years in this ministry. And uh, he was one of our founding board members. And he was just like, Tommy, I mean, you cannot walk into an African-American church to bring me with you. We got to go in two by two, you know? <laughs> and uh, he, he just constantly kind of, you know, was instilling that in me, uh, which was so refreshing. It was based on the story I shared with you guys, home church. And so, I mean, every single session of camp, and we now do about 20 sessions each summer. I mean, it's truly like a little, you know, social behind the curtain. And to the point that, you know, there's over 12,000 camps in America, which blows my mind. I mean, when we started in 1999, there were 8,500 camps in America. Now there's over 12,000 and the occupancy rate is over 90%, you know? So it's kind of like, if you build it, they will come, you know, type of mentality. And so you're right. I mean, it's a really slippery slope potentially. And we've seen this with a lot of schools that have tried to emulate our model you know, reserving half the spaces for low income. It's like, man, when money gets tight, you kind of want to compromise a little bit. And, and hey, maybe we're only scholarship, you know, 48%. And then maybe we're only scholarship 45%. No, no, no. You know, we've got the spreadsheets, you know, and we've got the spaces reserved. And, and there's just certain buckets for every single economic and, and racial and cultural traffic that we want represented at camp. And I think a lot of the staff, we have a 20 person staff now year round. And it's hard, you know, for a lot of people to understand, you know, that have worked at other camps where really the model is, we just want a bunch of kids, you know, we just want to love on kids. And, you know, it's first come first serve and if the session's full, we'll go to a wait list and maybe we'll open up another session. And, and for us, it's like, yes, you know, we're all about the kids too, but session at camp, you know, really has about 10 different buckets or demographics that we're trying to fill. And so you're not just managing, you know, hey, we want 100 kids for this. We want 10 kids that are low income African American. We want 10 kids that are upper income African American. We want 10, and it's just like, wow, you know. And so there's really any camp software out there on the market that you can purchase. You know, there's not a, a nice CRM that we, we can use, you know, to kind of manage the, you know, we, we have those things, but we have to build these spreadsheets kind of behind the scenes, you know, to kind of support the diversity, you know, that we're trying to create. And unfortunately, in terms of our staff, I mean, so many of our summer staff now are former campers. You know, in the early years, it was really challenging, you know, trying to find a staff. And, and we've built some wonderful relationships with different colleges and churches and organizations. But obviously it's incredible when you've got kids that have grown up and kind of bring that culture and that personal experience and want to kind of pay it forward. I mean, that's so sweet, you know, when God kind of orchestrates that and just seeing these kids that you've known, you know, since they were six years old, you know, coming to their first day camp, you know, now leading, you know, is amazing. And so, I think those are just some of the things that helped us to continue to be intentional about that. And then in terms of our program, I mean, we've never compromised. I mean, every minute of every day is designed to build friendships and shared it between kids who normally don't rub shoulders together. And so we felt like we needed to have a programming platform just as diverse as the campers that we were seeking to minister to. And so we realized we couldn't just be an athletic camp. You know, we couldn't just be an action adventure camp. And that was the problem 20 years ago. You know, we're in Nashville, Tennessee, you know, so we're building recording studios and film studios. We're doing stomp and drama and making of the band. And, you know, it's incredible to see that over half our kids are signing up for artistic, you know, specialties and tracks. And it never fails. I mean, first day of camp, I mean, you'll see kids in the parking lot, getting out of $50 cars and getting off the hot, stinky school bus with a trash bag full of clothes if they're lucky. And they're all just like sizing each other up. Just like, oh my goodness, what'd my mom get me into? You know, what'd my youth pastor sign me up for? You know, and everybody's judging each other, you know, just based on outward appearances, you know, just doing the flesh. And it knows, you know, the kids that are just like really kind of posturing, you know, they'll end up being in the recording studio together and, happens that they both are passionate about music and some of these kids don't even speak English you know and it's just like they still connect just through one thing that they have in common 
And it's incredible to see how sometimes those relationships in the recording studio will grow more quickly and go more deeply than the relationships in the or peer group or other. Um, so it's just so sweet, you know, to see how God has just continued to give us this, this playing field and this opportunity and platform to be able to talk about differences. And, and we'll actually just talk about the differences too. We do something called right foot, left foot. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen privilege lines, but it's kind of our version of the privilege line. We're on day four at camp where everybody thinks they got everybody figured out. You know, we'll line up uh, in a single file line, me included. And somebody will facilitate and they'll ask about 30, 40 questions based on privilege. And it's like, you know, if you grew up with a mom and a dad, take a step right. You know, if you didn't grow up, you know, with whatever, take a step to the left. And it's so powerful to see, you know, after these 30 or 40 questions, everybody spread out on the soccer field. And we just say, hey, stop, take a look around, you know, take it all in. Are, are you surprised, you know? Are you surprised where Tommy's standing? Are you surprised where your friend is standing that you came to camp with? Are you surprised where your new friend from the recording studio is standing? And it is so powerful to go back and debrief, you know, that experience in small groups. And that's where we really start to see some of the breakthroughs happening, you know, because the talk gets real. You know, it's like Monday and Tuesday, you're kind of talking about where you're from and where you go to school. You know, by Wednesday, you're kind of talking about what you believe. By Thursday, I mean, you're really going deep, you know, coming out of this exercise. And so it's just, it's refreshing to see the kids, you know, feel vulnerable and, and safe enough to be able to have these conversations. And you just can imagine that debrief goes a couple hours. Thank you for that. How old does a child have to be to uh, go to your wonderful camp? Rising kindergarten is where we begin. So not wow. for overnight camp, but we have day camp as well. So yeah, for day camp, rising kindergarten, a half day or you can whole day. And then we also have uh, like mommy and me and daddy and me, you know, type of weekends. And those also start with rising kindergarten. And it, it's heartbreaking, um, but about 48% of our kids don't have fathers. And so that's obviously part of my testimony. And so we really worked hard to try to find mentors uh, for the kids so they can still have that male role model. And so we've kind of opened up, you know, these parent child weekends, mentors and mentees. And that's been a really powerful experience. I remember the first time I took my son to one, uh, it was about six years ago, and he was seven years old. And uh, I'll never forget, you know, he was like, Dad that kid is kind of growing up the way you grew up. And I'm like, yeah, he is, you know, and, and just, just to be able to have that conversation and for him to kind of see and experience that, you know, and to talk about what it would have meant for me to have a mentor father son weekend with me and for him to have that reality was so powerful. And then we have a lot of um, Latino partners and I'll, I'll never forget, I got, I got the elbow and the ribs on this one, too, because at night in the cabins, you know, a lot of the Hispanic dads, I've never seen anything like this. I mean, they were praying for their sons. I mean, they had like their hands on their son's head, just praying these blessings and like tears were flowing. And my son, Bobby, was like, uh, dad, you should ever pray for me like that. <laughs> and I was like, that's a great question. You know, I, I've never seen that before. I mean, it was just so impactful, you know, what you can learn and glean, you know, from other cultures when you're truly living together in unity, like it talks about in Psalm 133, it was, it was powerful. Wow. <laughs> When the, uh, the children that you say that fly in, how long is uh, the camp session in days or weeks? They're one week. Yes, ma'am. They're, they're usually five nights and six days. So it, it's a pretty quick turnaround. We, we are praying that we might be able to expand our campus in the future because a lot of camps are, you know, two weeks, three weeks. And with what we're doing, you know, really good you know when the kids go home on day six and so we have asked that question a lot through the years is you know what could God do if we had another week 
you know, if we could go a little bit deeper, you know, what would our program look like? You know, what would we add to our program? What would change? And of course, you know, the most important thing, you know, spiritually and relationally, you know, what would the impact be if we could go from six days of camp to maybe 12 days of camp? And so that's something, you know, our board and our staff continue to pray about is just the expansion of our campus. But our heart is we want everybody to be able to come once. And so we have been blessed with, you know, just waiting list of campers now. And so it's like if we went ahead and went to two weeks, we have to reduce our population by 50 percent. And so we, we don't want to do that. Uh, and so we're just praying about how can we grow our campus and our facility to maybe be able to accommodate more people, have camps happening simultaneously you know, multiple sessions of camp, you know, at the same facility, because we're now blessed with about 150 acres. So we, we have room to grow. You know, it's just a question of, you know, again, God's timing, just being patient enough for that to happen. You have very wow. many Asian American kids. Very many. I mean, do you have a representative, like a group, like you have? We do. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we, we've had a sweet partnership with the Korean United Methodist Church, uh, which has been fantastic. Uh, in New Jersey, we actually had a group of kids fly uh, over from Korea to be part of the experience. And so they're now coming every two years, uh, which is wonderful because, again, just in, for the sake of transparency and honesty, uh, a, a lot of our minority kids traditionally have been more lower income. And again, just to use my son, I'll pick on him. You know, my son was like, dad, I mean, are, are all Hispanic people poor? Um, are all African-American people poor? Because that's what he's encountered the most at Barefoot. And so I'm just always praying, Lord, would you please just rock his world? You know, would you help us find partners because obviously there's plenty of affluent African-Americans, plenty of affluent Latinos and, and Asians. And that's been the toughest demographic for us to fill. And so when we got an email from a group in Seoul that wanted to fly over, as you can imagine, these, these kids were pretty wealthy and it really broke down a lot of stereotypes in that particular session of camp. You mentioned New, New Jersey. Jersey. So that, that's an awesome What was yes, the connection to New Jersey? I, I was actually hired as a consultant um, for the United Methodist Conference, and I don't know how familiar you guys are with the UMC up there, but holy cow. I mean, they had like 450 churches in their conference, and it was like the most diverse group of people I'd ever encountered, but none of them were worshiping together. I mean, it was just, it was bizarre. I'd go visit one church and then I would like drive around the corner, you know, to another church and it was just a completely different demographic. And so obviously they were wondering why I was hired as a consultant and I would share my story and they wanted me to come in and help them kind of rebrand, uh, reprogram their United Methodist uh, camp, which was really struggling. And ultimately they're just like, well, can you just come in and do a barefoot camp? <laughs> And I was like, absolutely, you know, and so we went up there, you know, just for a year and just kind of showed them what it could look like, you know, for them to have a camp that this, you know, versus having one week of camp for the Hispanic kids and one week of camp for the African-American kids and one week of camp for the, the white kids. And so that, that was thrilling for us, you know, to be able to share, you know, that with them. Well, I'm sure that the kids that were able to come from Korea were affluent, but there's a tremendous number of um, Asian kids in America who aren't. So it would be great Absolutely. if somehow increase that mm. connection. I don't know how to tell yeah. you to do those it. Those are praying for. Yes, ma'am. I mean, th those are those dots that we're, we're hoping are going to be connected, you know, sooner rather than later. I mean, I teach in a school in a district that is predominant, well, about a third, more than a third, almost half Asian. And um, I can tell you that somebody is cleaning the streets in Korea. They're not all, you know, affluent. Oh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. If any of them want to come to camp, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, was, I was going to ask if, we if there's a way. If we know any children who we think uh, it would 
but I mean, I think it would be good for any children we know to come to your camp, <laughs> but uh, where, would, where would we tell them to look for more information on it? Yes, ma'am, just barefootrepublic.org is the, the best place to start. Um, barefoot look, uh, barefoot, some people spell it like the animal. It's actually, you know, like their shoes, dot O-R-G. Uh, but obviously, Michelle, feel free to give anybody my email, um, my contact information. It'd be fun to get some more kids on the bus from New Jersey. Volunteers as well. We still, we have a summer staff, but we do supplement our summer staff uh, with one week volunteers. And so if anybody from the church or any of the parachurch organizations up there would want to serve for a week um, or even just come observe, you know, and see it, you know, we now have accommodations for that as well. So you do have, you do have a bus from New Jersey. You do have students who come from our campers that come from up here. Yes, ma'am. Great. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, yeah more study. Michelle is giving me a geography lesson. So they're coming from, uh, sounds like south of you guys by about an hour and a half or so. <laughs> well, we've got a lot of people in our county, so there's got to be some. <laughs> <laughs> well, we seriously would be interested, you know, if there's ever any desire. I, I know it's a lot and there's a lot of distance, um, but we would certainly entertain the conversation if there was interest. Are there any prerequisites if someone wanted to be a volunteer at the camp? Any uh, prior experience they need to have? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, obviously we want people that are just passionate about the gospel. Um, you know, we, ha we have an interview process uh, with our directors and it, there's really the focus is more on just the heart and where they are spiritually. Uh, certainly some questions about diversity and how comfortable are you you know, working with people from different backgrounds and, and, and really, you know, past experience isn't as important as just the open mindedness and the desire, you know, to want to be in an environment, you know, that is intentionally diverse. Night camp, it would be 18 and older. For the day camps, we have a lot of folks that fly in to help work at our day camps and we go a little bit younger We go down to high school. For people that want to serve at day camp in our actual area. Curiosity question. As your camp is progressing, say you get your kids in on the first couple of days, what has been the greatest challenge that you have faced when you bring together so many young people from so many different uh, backgrounds, etc.? That is the beauty of it is, I mean, our return rate now is about 65%. And so I, I would used, I, I used to would have answered that question by saying, you know, the greatest challenge is just kind of getting over the hump, you know, just kind of getting over that awkwardness um, and not being able to identify with one another, you know, just kind of judging each other at face value, you know, not giving the experience a chance. Uh, but now with the return rate of about 65%, I mean, there's so much pure, you know, pure modeling. And that's so powerful. It's one thing for 49 year old be like, it's going to be great kids. You know, it's a totally different thing when they've got their friends and their peers that are just like so excited and like, man, you, you can't wait till Iron Man, you know, Braveheart's amazing. You know, wait, you know, it's just like, they're the ones that are kind of, you know, planting the seed of encouragement, you know, for the kids. And so you kind of get around now two hours into the experience, you know, versus maybe two days into the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, collectively, you know, I will say that one of the biggest challenges I need to face is just finding staff, you know, that are you know, spiritually equipped, you know, just have um, just, just the tools and the experience, you know, to be able to sustain themselves for a summer. Because, I mean, as you all know, ministry can be exhausting, you know, and so we're, we're continually trying to figure out ways to, to find rest uh, and just, you know, refreshment for our staff because uh, it's easy to kind of hit a wall. And so I feel like that's, you know, the, the kids are loving it. You know, it's like if you look at our camper evaluations, you know, 99.9% .9 are just like, it's amazing. You know, if you look at our staff evaluations, you know, the first four or five weeks are great. And then I kind of hit a wall, you know, and I really feel like we create 
you know, more downtime and rest for our staff than most camps do. Um, at the same time, I think green, you know, requires a little bit more just spiritually, emotionally. Uh, it's tough, you know, and, you know, the, the breakthroughs are incredible. And, and what our partners tell us all the time is that, man, Tommy, we're serving these kids every day after school, you know, and we're just not seeing any breakthroughs. And, and then they go to barefoot and the breakthroughs happen. You know, it's just like, I'm excited about that, but why can't we get a breakthrough, you know, at the building mm -hmm. downtown, you know? And it's like, because it, it all works together. You know, God is truly working all of this together. Uh, but it, it is, it's a little bit of an emotional roller coaster, you know, for an 18 to 23 year old, kind of navigate that for a summer. So I'd say that is our greatest challenge, you know, currently is just finding, especially male staff. So I don't know if you guys know any male staff, but we're actually still looking between the ages of, you know, 18 to 23 for some summer interns and they are paid internships, uh, but it, it's hard to find guys, you know, to come out and make this commitment uh, to serve on our staff for a summer. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you for that. Any other questions for anyone? Okay. Um, in that case, um, I think I'm going to close with, um, so the first time I found out about Barefoot Republic was they had, a, there was a feature on them on Nightline on ABC. Um, I was up late doing a cross-stitch project I was trying to finish and I happened to see it and that, that it really uh, touched me and uh, I brought it to the deacon to consider for our Advent benevolence. And one quote that I think really struck me, it was from a participant in the camp, Kevon, and he said, I think heaven's going to look like barefoot. You're going to have at the same table, black mm. and brown and white and really every sort of color under the sun gathering around the table for love. So I thank you, Tommy, for sharing that um, your mission with us and uh, it's so important. And uh, we hope that uh, we'll continue to be able to share um, in this mission together in the future. And thank you for coming to talk with us. Thank you guys. This was a great. Yeah, thank you. Thank so you very much. Uh, Yes, thank y'all for the support. We really appreciate it. It really encourages our entire team, especially these great stories that can only be explained in and through him. So thank you guys for being part of the story. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for your presentation. And thank you, Michelle, for bringing him yes. to our attention. Yes. This was wonderful. Let me know if you guys have a road trip. Sorry, what was that? <laughs> Yeah, I said, let me know if you guys are up for a road trip. We'd love to have you come visit. <laughs> oh, <okay>. well. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah. We'll see okay. you later. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Blessing. Bye.